on the U.S.-India Business Council as well. Uh, and I know that the USIBC has been calling for a more liberal FDI regime, especially in sectors like uh, multi-brand retail, which this government has said is off the table, insurance mm -hmm. pending approval from Parliament, but they have decided to move now to 49%. What more is on the unfinished reform agenda that you would like this government to address from a foreign investor point mm -hmm. of view? Well, <clears throat> uh, I certainly believe, and I think most of the members of the IBC uh, that I sit on that board with would tell you that <clears throat> the more we can do to open trade flows and to allow an environment of um, open trade uh, across border will play a significant role in expanding economic uh, activity within country and cross border. So I think when we've talked about that, I think that's certainly anything that contributes mm -hmm. to that will be very important. The other specific thing I would say in response to your question is that whole universe of reforms that Mr. Modi is talking about in terms of ease of doing business mm. in India. Manufacturing uh, in India. Broader than manufacturing. I think manufacturing is a big piece of it, but just the, uh, in an oversimplification, uh, taking the 40 <clears throat> permits and approvals that may sure. be required to um, gets a transaction or a new venture started mm -hmm. and taking that to the one-stop window where uh, companies understand what the protocols and policies and regulations are going to be and they believe that they can actually get businesses up and running, get businesses expanded, get the permits mm -hmm. that they need without it taking uh, an exorbitant number of months and uh, multiple approvals and, and sign-offs that need to take place. So I, I think the reforms that um, many companies outside of India are looking for are just a continuation of a commitment to the ease of doing business mm -hmm. uh, reforms that I think the government is very much uh, understanding and, and sending very strong signals that they're willing to go after in an aggressive way at this point. Given the opportunities for growth in India and given the fact that you have some Indian conglomerates that are looking to expand their presence globally. What's your India team telling you about M&A and the kind of M&A activity or action that we are likely to see involving India? Well, you know, at KPMG, we have a big practice that uh, <clears throat> supports M&A activity on the part of the companies that we work with, whether that's deal advisory on the front end or integration assistance after those acquisitions have taken place. And we are seeing tremendous growth in that practice, both in India and, frankly, around the world right mm -hmm. now. It's a, I think, expanding M&A um, environment as we look globally today. And as I meet with my leadership here in India, I think we believe that's one of our highest growth um, service areas, potentially. And we're investing heavily in it. We're expanding our team. We're building even greater resources because we believe that companies here in India are going to need to continue to uh, call on us in a more active way mm. to assist them as they do look more aggressively to take advantage of the inorganic and the acquisition opportunities that exist to... So more outbound M&A is what you anticipate at this point in time or...? I think it's both actually. Uh, we are seeing a fair amount of outbound and uh, <clears throat> but I think we're going to see inbound uh, as well. So we are gearing up and, and again this is not on a hope and a prayer. We are actually seeing increased activity in the marketplace today that gives us great confidence as we expand our capabilities and expand our resources in the deal advisory space. You know, one of the other ambitious reforms that India is going to embark on, hopefully on the 1st of April 2016, is the goods and services tax, and this government has committed itself to a timeline. We don't know what the eventual GST rate is going to be. We understand that the government at this point in time is reversing the revenue neutral rate. But in your experience, what is the kind of disruption that we should expect, at least in the first year as we move towards the GST, and what would be the ideal GST rate in your experience? Well, I'm not sure I can comment on what the ideal rate would be, but I think um, any time I think uh, <clears throat> a government tries to move to a different basis of tax, I think it absolutely creates some disruption and some uncertainty. I think in this environment, um, the directional moves around lower tax rates, the introduction of the GST, I think are being viewed positively in terms of creating additional certainty. Mm -hmm and creating a more sustainable platform for the economy to grow here. Uh, so <clears throat> the way I would 
I think look at that is um, it's impossible to avoid some short-term disruption in an economy uh, when you introduce a new tax regime like that. I think you have to look at what is the long-term vision of the economic uh, environment you're trying to create, and is that short-term pain worth it to put the country on a more sustainable basis going forward, and that's the way I would view that, uh, that today. Okay, let me talk to you about uh, KPMG's plans for India. You said that last year India was your fastest growing market. Uh, is it on course to be the fastest growing market this year as well? And what does that mean in terms of the kind of headcount that you're looking at? I believe between uh, your BP operations and your main operations, you're about 13,000 people here in India. What more can we expect in terms of hiring this year? Well, I think it's a good story all the way around. Uh, <clears throat> When the India firm, and I don't mean if, I mean when the India practice achieves its goal and its plan for this year, uh, it will again be our fastest growing practice. So I think uh, I don't expect that to have just been a dynamic we saw last year and not just a dynamic we'll see this year. I actually expect that to continue for several years. So since that's our outlook for India, mm -hmm. it creates an environment where we are highly motivated to continue to invest aggressively as a firm into our practice here in India. And that manifests itself both in terms of headcount, so our BPO practice that you referred to, I think we expect to at least double that over the next three years okay. in terms of number of employees working in that BPO center. And in terms of our um, primary practice here in India, uh, again, I think we, we expect to see significant growth, probably a 50% increase in headcount over that same three-year period. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's not just growth to service the local marketplace here in India. We've got uh, a number of uh, projects we're working on with companies now where our professionals in India are working in the Middle East in liaison with our practices there. We mm -hmm. have great expertise and great talent here in India that we are trying to leverage not just for the benefit of our firm mm -hmm. here in India, but to make sure that our entire uh, firm globally uh, takes advantage of the kind of skills and talent that we have here sitting in India to really leverage those benefits uh, across the network. So what about m and possibilities for KPMG in India? I know that you're looking at data analytics as an area uh, to sort of, uh, you know, beef up your, your skills and your expertise. Uh, we've got a lot of startups in this space that are doing quite well. Would that be an area of opportunity that you would look at at all in India? Absolutely. We've got a very uh, small set of <clears throat> service areas that we believe are going to create um, incremental growth opportunities for KPMG over the next three to five years. We're investing heavily in those areas, both organically to grow those areas, but uh, acquisition activity is becoming a bigger and bigger part of our story as well. We've made nine acquisitions this calendar year globally, some very significant ones, and we expect that to continue. So and, what's the war and, test for, for and, acquisitions for M&A this year for you? Uh, you know, it's significant. I think in, just in the U.S. alone, for example, uh, we've been very clear that we're in the middle of a three-year uh, trajectory where we expect to spend a billion dollars in acquisitions over that three-year period, and uh, we're well down the path of uh, achieving that goal. And I think India, again, is a great source of talent and potential uh, companies that would fit very well, whether we're talking about in the digital space or cyber capabilities or the data and analytics skills that you referenced where India... Anything identified? Well, um, well you know, as you would expect, as I, I can tell by the way you <laughs> grinned when you asked that question, you know I can't answer that, but... Uh, Are we I, likely I, to hear an announcement this year I, or over the next couple of months to be more precise? I <laughs> think we will see announcements um, this year and continuing into the future of acquisitions that we are making uh, in this region and specifically in India. Well, John, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. We wish you the very best of luck with your plans for India and the rest of the world. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Well, on that note, it's time for us to wrap up the appointment for this week. We'll see you again next week. Till then, from the entire team, goodbye and many thanks for watching.